If you would grab your Bible and open up to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. And we'll begin reading there Nehemiah chapters 2 in just a second. Nehemiah chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading in a moment in verse 1. So on April the 3rd, 1968, uh, Martin Luther King preached a sermon. And the title of the sermon was, I have been to the top of the mountain been to the top of the mountain. And what was going on as he preached this sermon in Memphis is that the idea about being to the top of the mountain was an allusion to Moses, who got to the top of the mountain and could see Jerusalem, although he never really entered into it. And what was odd about him choosing that metaphor was that some of you know, April the 4th, the following day, 1968, he was assassinated. His sermon before that day was almost eerie in how well it predicted that this would happen. In fact, he ended his speech this way by saying, We may not all get to that promised land together, uh, but we'll get there. Very interesting. In fact, this week, of course, we honor the 50th anniversary of the assassination and the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, which is a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Our denomination put on a conference called MLK 50, along with others that was sponsored. And so I encourage you to go online, listen to some of the talks as they think about um, gospel and racial reconciliation in our culture, which very much applies to us as a state and a city and, and as a church. And in that speech, in that sermon Martin Luther King gave, he also referenced uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. You know it, we looked at it back in the spring, Luke chapter 11. The story of the Good Samaritan was, was that this man was beaten, robbed, and jumped and left for dead on the side of the road. And the first person that comes along this Jericho road, this very dangerous place, was a priest. And a priest had a very prominent position. If he touched something that was dead, then he could have been considered unclean. He could have been removed from his priestly duties, at least for a period of, of time. And so it cost him something. The second person that passed by was a Levite, not as high as a priest, but still had honorary positions and would also have costed something. And King said this, we don't know why they passed by, but let's assume this. Perhaps they were thinking, what if I help this person? What will that do to me? What if I help that person? What will it do to me? You know how the story ends. The Samaritan came, who technically should have been an enemy of the Jewish people. And he helped the man and he went to great sacrifice to to bring him back to health. In fact, sacrificed tremendous financially to bring him back to health. And so King said, it's interesting, the Samaritan reversed the question. The Samaritan asked the question, what if I don't do something? What will happen to him? What if I don't do something? What will happen to him? And if you understand that compassion, you really understand what's going on with Nehemiah. So Nehemiah was a Jew, but the Jewish nation was dispersed. Their country was ransacked and all the people had gone into exile into other nations. This is all a part of the judgment of God because they had said, God, we don't want you. And they turned their heart toward idols. And God said, if you don't come back to me, you're going to be dispersed. They wouldn't. They pushed, they pushed, they pushed on God. And finally, God said, I'm going to keep my promise to you to bring judgment. And he did. And now the Jewish people are all scattered. And so here we find Nehemiah who interestingly in his part of being scattered and in exile found himself in a prominent position. He was a cupbearer to the king which means he had access to the king. So really there's no way that Nehemiah should have been worried about anything else. He didn't have to worry about position. He had position. He didn't desire influence. He had influence. He didn't have to worry about where he lived. He lived inside the palace. For all practical standards we would say Nehemiah was set. But Nehemiah had this burning question inside of his mind. It was, if I don't do something, what's going to happen to them? Because God had made a promise in Jeremiah 29, chapter 11, that after the people were scattered, he would have them a future and a hope, and they would come back to him, but that had not yet happened. And this caused this reaction inside of Nehemiah. Remember we read it. First of all, there was a, a natural emotional reaction. He sat down and he prayed and he wept. And then there was a spiritual reaction. He began to pray and he began to fast over an extended period of time saying, God, would you do something? And we use this word to describe it. Nehemiah was broken. He prays this elaborate prayer in Nehemiah chapter 1. And what we find is, is what's driving Nehemiah is not just compassion for these people that's there. It's a bigger issue. It's what we might call kingdom advance. In other words, God had made this promise that in his kingdom he was going to store them all, bring them back, but he hadn't done it yet. And so God is, so Nehemiah is essentially saying, God, I'm broken over my own sin and I'm broken over the fact that you have not kept your covenant yet. 
God, when is the kingdom going to advance? And we made the observation that's very practical for us because Matthew chapter 6 tells us the first thing we're supposed to ask God when we pray is, Lord, your kingdom what? Your kingdom come, your will be done. So not unlike Nehemiah, although removed by place and time, we're asking for God's kingdom to be advanced in our lives. And we'll talk about what that means in just a minute, but it's essentially that the will of the king be done. And so Nehemiah is a broken man who in chapter 1 prays this broken prayer over his people. How is this city gets torn down, going to be restored, and how are these people going to be helped? In chapter 2, everything changes. Because what we learn in chapter 2 is that Nehemiah is not just this mystic holed up in his prayer closet hoping God will do something. Nehemiah is a person of action. And what's driving his action is not just that he's a person of action. What's driving his action is the same thing that's driving his prayer in chapter 1. It's, it's brokenness. So maybe a way to understand this would be chapter 1 is prayer of brokenness. And chapter 2 is brokenness in action. Here's what a broken person does. Here's how they act. Now the way chapter 2 unfolds is like this. There's a setting in verse 1 and there are four scenes in the story. So that's the structure of this chapter. Let's walk to it, through it together. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. Here's the setting for the story. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. He notices the month of Nisan. He puts a time stamp on it. The last time we saw a time stamp was back in chapter 1 when he first found out what was going on inside Jerusalem. It was about the fall of the year, November, December. This is about this time of year. It's late March or April. Uh, the bottom line is that this is about four months had elapsed. Now, what's going on in those four months? Well, we don't exactly know, but the point is, Nehemiah doesn't say, God, look, I'm upset about something, and he doesn't do the first thing that comes to his mind. Aren't you glad you often don't do the first thing that comes to your mind? He doesn't immediately go act. He prays. And for months he's been praying and praying and fasting and thinking and thinking and thinking. And he's serving the king one day. We learn later that the queen is there. And when he's serving the king, he sat in the king's presence. Meaning that the sadness and the brokenness that's inside of him, he can't hide anymore. And it comes on the outside of him. And the king notices it. And that leads us to this first scene. Look at the first scene. It goes from verse 2 all the way down to verse 8. Look at verse 2. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing that you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. And then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And then the king said to me, well, what are you requesting? What do you want? So I prayed to the God of heaven. It's just, just an unbelievable narrative. Here's Nehemiah. He's in the king's presence. And perhaps he's been sad for a long time. We don't know. But eventually the king picks up on it and says, why are you so sad? He can't hide it anymore. And the king says, well, look, what, what's going on with you? Nehemiah, the text tells us, is afraid. Why? Well, because, because he's stuck. He can't, he can't do anything else. You see... He could go back and say, look, I've got this phenomenal life here in the palace. I can live and die here. I can, uh, you know, live a good life. I can be very comfortable. But he had already made the decision that that was not a possibility for him. He couldn't, he couldn't do that. His burning question was in his mind. What if I don't help? What's going to happen to them? He couldn't get away from it. And so then he knew he had to take option number two, which was he had to help. Here's the problem is he can't help. He doesn't have the financial resources. He doesn't have the capacity. And so he realizes, perhaps, that what has to happen is, if he's actually going to be the catalyst to make this happen and move, he's got to get the heart of the king. So, of course, he's afraid. But notice something very important. While he is in fear, he's not motivated from fear. What's driving him is not the fear of the king. If that's the case, he would have backed off. What's driving him is God keeping his covenant and his compassion for these people. And it says, when the king says, what do you want? He doesn't immediately pray. He doesn't immediately respond. He takes a breath. And you notice the end of that verse, verse 5, it says, and I prayed to the God of heaven. It's really interesting. Chapter 1, we have this long prayer of Nehemiah. 
If Nehemiah would have prayed that prayer in a public setting, you would have perhaps thought, it's too long. Why is this guy being so spiritual to show off all that he knows? Would you just get to the point already? But notice when he's in a tight spot, he just breathes a prayer because the person who can spend intimate time with God and who knows the word of God and can pour out their heart to God, they have the same access to the same miracle working God when they have to pray a prayer that's just a breath. Like in a moment when you say, oh, oh God, help me. It's essentially what he prayed. Now, watch what happens next. Look at verse 6. And the king said to me, or excuse me, go to verse 5. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, this is the answer to the question, what do you want? And if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting behind him, beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and when I had given him a time, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make the beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. I love the drama in this first scene. It's almost when you begin that Nehemiah seems really coy, right? Nehemiah, are you sad? No, I'm not sad. What are you, I'm not sad. King, what are you talking about? I think you're the one that's sad. I'm not sad. I'm fine. Are you sure? No, I'm not fine. Nehemiah, no, I'm not. Seriously, I'm, Nehemiah. Okay, look, here's the deal. Here's what I need. And he just begins to rattle it off. First of all, I'm going into very difficult territory. I need letters to be sent for the ones beyond the river and the ones in front of the river so I can pass through. Secondly, here's the deal. I need to go on a long journey to rebuild this city, and I'm going to take several months off. And third, when I go, I'm going to be in a vulnerable position. So I need some military escort to keep me. We learned in chapter 2 he has this military escort that's going to take care of him. And oh, by the way, just one other thing, King, I need timber, lots and lots of timber. So much timber, I can rebuild a wall, rebuild a temple, and build a place for myself. That's really all I need. Let me just stop here and say just something really, really practical. Students are looking for your first job, you're out there in the world. This is a phenomenal statement of someone who was so, so prepared. He didn't just pop off with some idea. He knew how long he would be gone. He knew what it was going to cost. He had already done risk assessment to know all the risks that were involved. And the king evidently is so enamored with this, the king says, okay. Okay. Now, that's what happened Here's the big question, why did it happen? Well, Nehemiah tells us the answer to that with the last phrase of verse 8. Look at this. It's the most important phrases in the book, and even in Ezra and Nehemiah together. Last phrase, last sentence of verse 8. And the king granted me what I asked for, for the good hand of my God was upon me. The king granted me what I asked for, for the good hand of my God was upon me. What's going on here? Well, don't make any mistake. This wasn't just a general thing like saying, God was sure good to me today. Nehemiah was mentioning something very, very specific, and it was this. The hand of God always referred to God's power. And so what Nehemiah was saying is, the reason why God blessed me is because I was accessing the power of God. Now, don't turn to it, but just listen to this. This is so significant. Maybe you can write this down. Jeremiah chapter 16. Jeremiah is the last prophet who is screaming to the nation, don't disobey God, don't go into exile. Jeremiah 16, God uses Jeremiah to say to them, look, if you keep going, I'm going to put you in exile, and here's why I'm going to do it. Because of your idolatry, you're worshiping foreign gods. And I'm going to put you in that exile, but I'm going to deliver you, the end of chapter 16 says, because I want you to know my great power. I want you to know my power. What it's like to have my hand on you. And so here comes Nehemiah, who's the opposite of Jeremiah 16. He knows they have idolatry, so he confesses that sin. And he says, I want to show you, God's going to do all this to demonstrate his great power. His great power. So here's the main idea, I believe, of the text. It's simply this. We serve a powerful God. God is powerful. So if you pray for God to move... You have to also plan for God to move. That's the idea. God is powerful. So if you pray for God to move, you also have to plan for God to move. There's something intensely practical about what Nehemiah is doing, but it's also intensely spiritual. 
He prayed to God because that was the right thing to do. He was deferring to God. God, if this has any success, it's only because of you. But believing that God was going to do that, believing that God heard his prayer, he made intense plans. So detailed that, in fact, when the king asked him, he just rolled them off the tip of his tongue. He knew exactly what needed to be done. And chapter 2 is no less spiritual than chapter 1. So let me say this. Planning without prayer is presumptuous. God, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And after I get through, God, I'll ask you to bless it. That's planning without prayer. But listen very carefully. Prayer without planning is equally presumptuous. God, I'm just going to pray about it, but I'm never going to do a thing. That's not Nehemiah. Why? Well, because he had this overwhelming sense of God's power. We serve a God that's so powerful. If we pray for him to move, he's probably going to do it. And so we should not only pray for him to move, we should plan on, on him moving, is what he's saying. So there he is. The first scene is a scene of petition. He gets exactly what he wants from the king, and he gets it because God's power is moving. And now the story shifts a little bit. It moves from a scene of position, petition to a scene of opposition. Look what happens in verse 9. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen, but, verse 10, when Sanballat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. And this is so important here. Why is it that he's facing opposition? He's just had a phenomenal day. He goes in essentially as someone who's just a servant in the king's court and he leaves with all this access and all this opportunity. Things are moving. And before he even gets to Jerusalem, so he's going to Jerusalem and he's taking all these resources. Before he even gets there, people find out about it. We don't know who these guys are, but they're already upset that he's doing this. Now, why is that significant? Well, it's very significant for us for this reason. Let me stop here and interject a practical application that will go on with the story. What Nehemiah, again, is really about is kingdom advance. And what does that mean, kingdom advance? Sounds like a spiritual term. Well, Jesus Christ came preaching that what we should live for is for the success of the kingdom. So what does the kingdom mean? Well, it just means where the kingdom is successful, the will of the king is being done. So people are, the, the chains of bondage of sin are falling off of them. They're getting rid of addiction. They're living God's purpose in their life. Having victory over sin. Their attitude and their heart is changed. They're having joy in their life. All those things are the will of the king. And where the will of the king is taking place in your life, that means the kingdom is advancing. I mean, you're like an army that's marching on. It's taking over new territory. And that's a great metaphor to understand what our relationship with God is like. What our relationship with God is like is I have areas of my life that are completely yielded to God. And then there are areas where I, I don't want to yield that. It's a struggle for me. And what God wants to do is to advance that kingdom. But now watch this. Just by definition, if that kingdom is going to advance and take over more territory in my life, that, team, that territory is currently occupied with something else. So I should expect opposition. Now we know this to be true, but let me just say it, and I want you to hear it, and just pretend, I'm not going to say it a thousand times, but just pretend for emphasis I'm saying it a thousand times. There is no kingdom advance without opposition. Now there's a way not to have opposition. It's to not want to advance the kingdom. You can just look at your life. I can look at my life and say, well, it's not great, but I just, you know, take what I can get. Sure, I've got some habits that I don't want. Sure, I've got some attitudes I don't want. Sure, I have some relationships I should probably get out of. But I'm just going to leave that. But if you're not satisfied with that, and if you're not satisfied with your children and your grandchildren and your friends and your relationships where there's no kingdom advance, if you want kingdom advance in there, always expect opposition. It'll come from your flesh. It'll come from enemies of the kingdom. It'll come from all different types of places. And so it's just there. The deeper spiritual issue goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Where after Adam and Eve sinned and they're cursed, God promises his curse upon the snake and his curse upon them that this snake, this serpent, allowed to come in and have access to them because of sin, would always be there to bruise their heel. Satan will always be on the heels of those who want kingdom advance. 
I'm not telling this because it makes you happy. It's just real. It's just the truth. There'll always be opposition to kingdom advance. So Nehemiah hasn't even gotten working. He He hasn't even gotten started. But already that seed of opposition is there. Now watch what happens in the third scene. Verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I rose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one which I rode on. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went into the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I was not yet, did not yet tell the, told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were there to do the work. And these are the people that had been left after the exile. There was a remnant that was left inside of Jerusalem. And they didn't know this, but when Nehemiah came, he wasn't just there to say hello. He didn't exactly tell them what his reasons were for being there. He just kind of silently did inspection, is doing a fact-finding mission. What they don't know yet is that he is, he's leading them right now, and he's going to ask something of them. Verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build so they strengthen their hand for the good work. And so he has a scene of petition where he gets requests from the king that's granted. Then a scene of opposition. And finally he goes in there with a scene of inspection. Now he's figuring out what's going on. And after he does the inspection and tells them about it, they say, okay, let's do it. Let's rise up and build. And once again, that's what happened. But don't miss this. Nehemiah tells us why it happened. Go back to verse 18 again. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. He says what's driving this is the power of God. So again, God is so powerful. If we pray for God to move, we have to also at the same time plan for God to move. Looking at this passage of scripture and looking at this whole book, we made the observation that Nehemiah is in a sense a a corporate book. It's about a group of people. And so we have to look at it in terms of how we apply it to our lives in both a me, what is God saying to me, and both a we. And so let's talk about the me for a second. We're looking at this. It's very important to note, first of all, right up here near the front of the series, because I want you to think about this all the way through, that this is not driven necessarily by facilities. What it's driven about for Nehemiah is kingdom advance. The kingdom is not advancing. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that God no longer dwells in a temple made with hands. God would dwell in the temple. He would dwell in the tabernacle. And his presence was manifest inside the Holy of Holies. That's no longer the case. But rather, we are told that our bodies, we ourselves, are the temples of God. So logically... The same passion that he had to see kingdom advance, to see the temple rebuilt so he could have a manifest place for the presence of God. We should carry that same passion for the advance of the kingdom inside of our lives. Which leads us to ask this question. How are the walls in your life? Is your your eye gate crumbling and broken down? So you're letting things in that should never come inside. Is your ear gate broken down? Or maybe in an unfiltered way, you're taking all the best entertainment that the world can offer and just bringing it inside of your temple where God is supposed to dwell. Or maybe it's not what you're exposing yourself to, it's what you're exposing other people to because the mouth gate is broken down and maybe you're saying things that you shouldn't say. Look, we can pray about those things, but here's, I think, our encouragement from our brother Nehemiah. Look, God's so powerful. If you pray about it, then you also ought to plan for God to move. To say it another way, if God were to answer the prayer request that we have right now, what adjustments are we willing to make to see that thing come to fruition? If God were to come into your space, what else would need to be adjusted to accommodate his presence? Maybe say it this way, if God moves in, what has to move out? If God moves in, who has to move out? 
Maybe there's a, there was a relationship that shouldn't be there. It's not unhealthy. You need to move away from that thing. Or the truth of the matter is you're too close to somebody. You need to. And you just need to cut that off. Because if God moves in, some things and some people need to move out of our lives. And we can pray about that. But what if God is so powerful he wants to answer that prayer, but a company with that prayer needs to become the plans of faith that actually say by physical action, this is exactly what I'm believing God to do. Let me say it this way. As we said before, said a minute ago, that prayer without, or that planning without prayer is presumption, but also planning without prayer, or, or rather prayer without planning, is equally as presumptuous. If you plan without praying, you can say, God, look, I don't need you to move. But if you pray without planning, what we're saying is, God, don't move me. The first is saying, God, we don't need you to move. The second is saying, God, I want you to move, but just do it without moving me or causing an adjustment in my life. But God's, God doesn't work that way. He's so powerful, he takes all of us. His presence so overwhelming it consumes all of us. And if we want to see our prayers answered from a powerful God, we have to pray, but we also have to, to plan for him to make that adjustments inside of our, inside of our lives. And this is what oftentimes, corporate, corporately, thinking about the we, this is oftentimes what churches would do. We'll say, God, we love you so much. We want a massive movement of your presence. God, we want you to do great things. We want to see people broken from addiction. We want to see people set free. We want to see people healed. We want to see a massive move where people are getting saved on a large scale. And God, which do major league changes. And God, do them in such a big way that I don't have to move at all. Because God, I'm going to come and I'm, this is what I'm willing to do. God, that's, it's there. That's it. But God, you do something huge. Just leave, leave me here. And our prayers at that point become presumptuous. I mean, just, they're just meaningless. It's pretense. Because there's no plans behind them. God is so powerful that when we pray for him to move, we have to plan for him to move. The last scene of the story, the fourth scene, is also a scene of opposition. Look at what happens in verse 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem, we don't know who he is, they're just piling on though, and they're not the guy that doesn't like for it to happen, Geshem, the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And that was a very significant accusation. Then I replied to him, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. <laughs> I love this, because here's what's going on. These guys are so myopic. They're so narrow focused. They're saying, wait a minute, what are you doing? Are, are you actually trying to go against the king? You understand that's a, that's a horrible thing that you're doing, trying to go against the king. And here's what he does. Nehemiah says, look, I want to back up and I want you to see the big picture. I serve a king that is so much bigger than the one who's currently on the throne. I serve the king over all things. And we see Nehemiah do that. We see him appeal to the God of heaven. It reminds us of something. What it reminds us of is, well, is the king. It reminds us of someone who, although Satan will come and bruise our heel, God promised to Eve that she would have a seed that would come here, who come and he would bruise the head and crush the head of the serpent. That's the king that we serve. What it reminds us of, there was someone else who was broken in prayer and wept over Jerusalem. There was someone else, remember, who got on a donkey and rode into the city. And there's someone else who was so broken in prayer that that led to brokenness in action. And the brokenness in action meant for him executing the plan of God by which his own body would be broken. Praise Jesus. He's the king of the kingdom. Have you ever heard this phrase? Expect great things from God attempt great things for God. Have you ever heard that? Expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. It's, it's a wonderful phrase because in that little couplet, very poetic, you have a great synopsis of really the life of Nehemiah. Look, I believe God wants to do great things, so I'm going to pray, but I'm also going to plan. I'm going to expect, but I'm also going to attempt. But 
that little quote becomes even more provocative if you understand the history that's behind it. It was first spoken by a guy named William Carey. And William Carey was a minister in Great Britain, late 1700s, early 1800s. And he and another man by the name of Andrew Fuller were responsible for what we call the, the great mission movement that took place in Baptist life. Now, if you grew up here at Emmanuel, born in the lobby maybe, because a lot of you I know were. There's a lot of people here that just grew up in Emmanuel all your life. You're thinking, man, we've always, Baptists are always been a missionary people. And sadly, it's, that's not the case. In fact, the time that William Carey lived, the dominant thought was this. If God wants to save the heathen, he'll do it with or without us. We're just going to sit here and, and pray for something to happen. So Carey lived and died to make sure that that someone and something was him. Listen to this. In 1787, Carey was at a minister's meeting, and he was trying to press the people to fulfill their duty, the other pastors that were there, to reach people around the world. And this is true. This is what happened. Another minister, John Ryland, stood up and said this, quote, young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid and mine. End of quote. Young men, sit down. When God wants to reach the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. In other words, this is the idea, we're just going to sit here and we're going to pray about it. We're going to pray and pray and pray. And if God wants to do it, look, God's more powerful than us. We're not stopping him. If God wants to do it, he can do it. Well, William Carey, unlike the priest and the Levite, was asking a different question. The question he was asking was not, what if I do this, what will happen to me? What if I don't do this, what will happen to them? And Carey actually believed that if gospel mission didn't advance around the world, the people who had never heard the gospel would die without Christ and be lost forever. And so he just went. He went to India. And there in India, you can go visit his grave there. He's actually got three wives that are buried there. They took along the field. They just could not bear the weight of the hardship. Seven children are buried there. Incredibly tragic and difficult life, but here's the result of it. It spawned what we know as the entire foreign missions movement. Because one person says, I guess we can pray about it, but the truth of the matter is, if God is powerful to hear a prayer, maybe he's powerful enough to answer the prayer. And if he's powerful enough to answer the prayer, maybe I should plan that he will. God is so powerful. So when we pray for him to move, we must plan for him to move. Father God, we are grateful for your love for us, Father. We thank you for this incredible witness of our brother, Nehemiah, who went before us to show us what it was like to advance the kingdom. And Father, following his leadership, Lord, we want to see kingdom advances in our individual lives, in our homes, our families, and Lord, in this church. Father God, I pray that be a reality right now in this moment. And what we're doing right now is not the end of the service. This is the beginning. Um, life begins, Christian life begins, our walk with God begins when we yield to him. When we say, okay, God, I'm, I'm in. And so this, again, this is the beginning right now. It could be some right now that you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. And you need to know that Jesus Christ really did come to the earth. He was the Son of God. He lived as a man because at the end of his life, he died. And when he died and was crucified, he uh, took on upon himself all the wrath that God intended for our sins. And because of that, if we believe in him and do two things, believe in him with our heart and repent and turn from our sins, we can be saved. We can have a relationship with him. And maybe that's you. You know about church things. You've been around the church culture. You get all the things. But the truth of the matter is there's never been a time, a moment, we said, okay, God, I'm, I'm all in. This is me. I'm giving all my heart and life to you. And right now is your moment. Right now. And if that's where you are, you need to tell God that right now. Just tell him that you want your sins forgiven. Just right now. Tell him you want to give your life to him. Tell him you, that you believe that he died and that he rose again. And you want to accept the offer of salvation that he's extending to you right now. There are others here that you've already done that. You've already given your heart and life to Christ. But the truth of the matter is there's some walls that are broken down. 
And this is your moment. This, again, is not the end of the service. This is the beginning. And God is moving your heart in some specific way. Let's make this altar your altar of prayer. And don't wait for me. Just grab somebody right now that's beside you. Just stand to your feet wherever you are. and Just come and just kneel here and just spend some time in prayer. And saying, God, I, I want to spend some time seeking you in the face. This is just a family. We're all here. Just do that even now. Stand to your feet. Step out and come wherever you are and just kneel here and pray. If you want to join the church, there'll be people here at the front to talk to you about that. If you say, that's me. I prayed and I gave my heart and life to Christ or I need to give my heart and life to Christ. You want to talk to somebody about it? Again, there'll be ministers here at the front would love to talk to you about what it means to have a relationship with Christ. You just step out and you just come. Father God, we love you. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would move in this moment, in this place, and in this time. And Father, we pray it because of you. Amen.